In Connecticut, nearly all roads lead to the suburbs. The car is absolutely essential for enjoying the fruits of American life. In a sense, a driver's license is our passport to citizenship. Without a driver's license, you're, you're really no one. But the rush to the suburbs has led to a slowdown on Connecticut's roads. Although our population is not growing very much at all, the number of trips that we're taking cumulatively is growing very significantly, and the length of those trips are growing. More than any other state service, it's the transportation system that most residents use on a daily basis. Transportation is at the heart of the state's economy. It's at the heart of our quality of life. We depend on it to get to work. We depend on it to move our goods into and out of the state. We depend on it for pleasure trips and shopping trips. Connecticut has one of the most congested road systems in the country, and things are going to get worse. I think our highway system, particularly the secondary roads, will be very congested. Uh, you'll have a lot of frustrated people who are going to be sitting in traffic much longer than they are now. Experts agree that new roads are not the solution to the state's traffic problems. We have a good system. It's in good shape, but it simply is not able to continue to grow to meet all of the demands that are being placed upon it by our society today. Getting from here to there has always been a high-profile public issue. The automobile is just the latest in a long series of technology that we've used to let people do what they want to do. Transportation enables people to make the choices that they want to make. Our love-hate relationship with the roads we use goes back more than 200 years. Until the latter 19th century, Connecticut residents depended on stagecoach and buggy travel over dirt roads. Travel was hard, and mobility, at about eight miles per hour, was limited. In 1792, as Connecticut's population grew to about 200,000, the state government started to franchise privately owned turnpike companies in order to promote the growth of the state's road system. Over the next 50 years, 150 turnpike companies built and maintained 1,400 miles of private toll roads, looking to make a profit from passing traffic. But the rise of the railroad in the last half of the 19th century and the increased use of free alternative roads led to the decline of the turnpike companies. By 1855, the toll roads were largely abandoned, with maintenance taken over by the towns. Most of Connecticut's roads were little more than muddy paths which connected major towns. People living in the country, particularly the farmers, were living on muddy, impassable roads during springtime thaws and unplowed roads during the winter. There were no connecting roads between the cities to speak of during 12 months of the year. This intolerable situation led to the formation of the Connecticut Highway Department in 1895 with the goal of getting the farmer out of the mud. In 1878, the Pope Manufacturing Company in Hartford manufactured the first bicycles made in the United States. Connecticut's growing middle class quickly embraced bicycling, which provided unprecedented personal mobility. Organized by Colonel Albert Pope, the state's bicyclists soon became leading advocates of better roads. By 1901, the need for improved state roads became a critical public issue as more people bought automobiles. That year, Connecticut enacted the first traffic law in the United States, limiting speeds to 15 miles per hour in the country and 12 miles per hour in the city. In 1903, the state began to register automobiles. In that first year, 1,353 vehicles were registered. In 1913, the State Highway Department established the first system of state highways. The new department began to modernize the 14 routes comprising the system. This involved eliminating grade crossings and railroads, reducing steep grades, eliminating sightline problems, using the 14 trunk lines as Connecticut's basic highway system of the time. During the early 30s, many of these roads were typically clogged with ever-growing numbers of automobiles and increasing truck traffic, causing frequent delays and numerous accidents. 
we had a very active road building program quite early in the 20s and 30s so that by the time of World War II, we had 3,000 miles of paved road in a state that's only 5,000 square miles. The most heavily traveled road was Route 1 along Connecticut's coast. Route 1 had always been a busy route, used by both state residents and long distance traffic moving between Boston and New York. As the traffic increased, the suburbs moved out from the urban areas. Places like Glastonbury and Manchester and Reading and the towns surrounding Bridgeport and New Haven suddenly found themselves accessible by automobile. Congestion started to enter the picture. The automobile, of course, has been the thing that has really completed the suburbanization of Connecticut very early. The heavy traffic on Route 1 led to the opening in 1940 of the state's first modern highway, the Merritt Parkway. We have had but one endeavor, and that has been to do the best that we could for the state of Connecticut. We came out for the Merritt Parkway which is completed, and for rural roads, which are being constructed in every part of the state. The Merritt Parkway was acclaimed as one of the most beautiful highways in America. After World War II, both the urban population and car ownership significantly increased. Massive federal and state highway programs financed the construction of new highways and the upgrading of secondary roads. New and better roads further increased mobility, allowing more state residents to move to towns farther out from the cities. The biggest post-war road project was the construction of the Connecticut Turnpike in 1958. As soon as the movement to the suburbs after the Second World War took off, Connecticut embarked on the greatest suburban support program that any state has seen. You know, we really invented the interstate highway, and a lot of people don't realize that I-95 along the shoreline was built before there was an interstate system. It was incorporated in afterwards, that's why we had tolls, that's why there's so many exits on it, because in fact it was designed for people to commute from the suburbs along the shore into the cities. more cars, more on our roads than last year, and there'll be more next year, and the year after that, more and more cars will be built, and more cars will be bought. President Eisenhower's militant call for a grand plan to provide a modern, controlled access highway system for safe, efficient transcontinental travel led to the passage of the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956. The federal highway system brought Interstate 84 and 91 to Connecticut. These roads and other highways like them allowed residents to live in once remote small towns and villages across the state. With suburban growth came increased demand for highway and road expansion. Connecticut's urban population continued to decline as the suburbs flourished. In the last 40 years, as Connecticut's suburban lifestyle evolved, we've greatly transformed how we get from place to place. In my earlier days, back in the early 80s, traffic primarily traveled into downtown. All the insurance companies, large businesses were located there. Since then, a lot of them have migrated to the suburbs. So the interchanges, which were primarily built and designed to handle traffic just coming into downtown and dumping off, now have to be able to handle this traffic to continue through. It's really provided some new and unique traffic problems. We have seen a tremendous growth in, in the mobility of, of people. We've seen a tremendous growth in where they go. The old spoke and wheel system from outlying areas into the center city to work has basically disappeared in favor of people going from one suburb to another suburb or transversing through various communities. 
Husbands and wives now typically work at two jobs. On the way to work, we're dropping off our dry cleaning, we're dropping off the kids at daycare or at school, uh, and uh, coming home, we're picking up a bite to eat at a convenience store and, and running a lot of other errands in midday. So what we would refer to as trip chaining, linking up multiple trip purposes, you can see the bias it starts to lend toward the automobile and toward a system that's able to respond to our functional demands. The number of vehicles registered in Connecticut has steadily increased at a rate much faster than the amount of road mileage in the state. People have their cars for a reason. We have two career families. We have had for many generations land use policies favoring the single family home. We are the oldest populated part of the nation, therefore we have land that's been developed forever. You don't have a lot of choices about where you're going to put certain kinds of facilities any longer. The car is the way. The overwhelming majority of people are going to go to work, and going to work alone is going to be the way the overwhelming majority of people go. It doesn't help us to call those people bad. They are merely coping based on the choices available. I got my car in 1962. <laughs> I paid $300 for it. It is a lot of fun just driving the car when you, whenever you can put the top down. We are members of the Connecticut Area Classic Thunderbird Club, and, and we, we all love our cars! What's the first thing a 16-year-old kid wants? His driver's license. Go by every house in the suburb. You tell me if you see one car, or if you don't see two or three cars. We have a love affair with our automobile. That's our bit of independence. We want to be able to jump into that vehicle, drive to our place of employment, whether it's an office or a shop, a factory, and we want to be able to park as close as possible to the front door there. And then comes 4.30 or 5 o'clock, God forbid we should have to wait the carpool with somebody and take them home. Since 1973, highway travel in the state has increased by 84%, while the total road system has increased by less than 3%. The result is spreading congestion and more frequent delays. The state of Connecticut has about 20,000 miles of, of roadways, of which about 4,000 miles of that are state highways. And we really monitor the traffic that's on the state highway system itself. About 20% of those miles are under congested conditions, which primarily occur during the peak hours, the commuting hours, either in the morning or in the afternoon. We anticipate about a 20 to 30% increase in vehicle miles of travel in Connecticut over the next 20 year period. Clogged roads create pollution, cause more accidents, and hurt state economic development as it takes longer for people and goods to get to their destinations. The worst traffic snarls and tie-ups in the state take place in the Connecticut Turnpike Corridor from New Haven to the New York State Line. I-95 opened in 1965 as a toll road with the $464 million cost financed entirely by the state. Today, about 30% of the roadways within the I-95 corridor are over capacity, with the congestion level projected to increase up to 55% in the next few years. I-95 itself is at 180% of the rush hour capacity for which it was designed. The congestion problem means that uh, we now measure distance in Fairfield County in minutes, not miles, that uh, more people listen to the traffic report than the weather report, and that uh, typical commuter taking a 19-mile trip, for example, from Fairfield to Stamford will expect to spend during rush hour from 45 to 55 minutes on a day without rain or accident. That's a problem. Our studies have indicated that that peak hour problem, which now extends for three hours in the morning and three hours at night, plus or minus, by the year 2010 is going to extend all day long. We're going to be looking at a 12 hour a day peak hour. We're going to be looking at the same kind, albeit a couple of years beyond that, in the Hartford area. So what we're looking at is a tremendous increase in the, in the volume of traffic that our system simply cannot adjust to. And there is no way that we can build our way out of the problem. We cannot build new highways to keep up with this kind of a demand. In the capital region, the 84 West Corridor has also experienced major growth and serious traffic problems, with about 155,000 vehicles a day using the highway from Hartford to Waterbury. In 1997, 
the State Department of Transportation began a lengthy planning process involving municipalities and agencies to determine how best to improve the overloaded corridor. This April, in a reversal of its historic role in building new highways as a solution to traffic congestion, the DOT ruled out adding a fourth lane to I-84. The environmental social impacts of those major highway construction projects uh, just are not acceptable anymore. This is giving us an opportunity to look at some alternative systems, to look at some light rail, perhaps some busway type of systems. In the southeastern part of the state, the Route 2 corridor has seen drastic increases in traffic, primarily because of casino development and tourism growth. Since the casinos have opened, traffic has increased by up to 40,000 cars a day. Traffic congestion in the state is not limited to major highways. The secondary roadways are really, really starting to take some heat. Route 4 is one that has really, really become so heavy. I don't know how anybody drives it on a regular basis. I can see when I announce a major accident on a highway, particular exit ramps and roadways just automatically starting to build up with traffic. We're driving on roads that were cow trails 200 years ago. Now they're two-lane roads. You're trying to make them into three-lane roads. They don't have good interchanges. And it's become very, very difficult to commute, and it's a growing problem. I don't know what the answer is, because you can't build interstates through Simsbury and Avon. In the past, increased traffic often led to new roads or expanded existing roads. But heightened environmental concerns, local objections, and limited finances adversely affect the state's ability to increase road mileage. The DOT's annual budget for capital projects and maintenance is about $604 million. The reality of building brand new roads or brand new transit systems in the state is very, very slim because of the dollar situation that we're in. We probably spend somewhere in the range of 60 to 70 percent of those resources is, is maintenance or minor improvement oriented and only about 30 percent of those resources is for expansion. We could easily spend a lot more and certainly many of the things that we do that people don't fully understand that are essential to the operation are extremely expensive. We have a catenary system for example on the railroad that was built in the early 1900s. We're looking at costs like 300 million dollars to replace that system. We're looking at bridges at $140 million to replace. Financing and the affordability of transportation alternatives is a fundamental problem. In the Hartford West Corridor study, the Capital Region Council of Governments is planning for about $250 million in transportation improvements. But experts claim that even that may not be enough. At our first blush of alternatives, thinking of the scope and the size of the improvements that need to be made, will far exceed that. So where do the funds come from? And that's a critical issue. Other parts of the country are resorting to answers that Connecticut a long time ago said that it didn't want to resort to when we took the tolls off uh, Interstate 95 and took the tolls off the Merritt Parkway as an example. Does the political system have the will to make the tough financing decisions I think that's probably the critical transportation decision that we're going to have in the, next, uh, in the next decade is, can we spend the money that we need to spend? In 1983, two highway tragedies riveted state residents' attention on the transportation system. In January, a truck slammed into three automobiles waiting at the Stratford Toll Plaza, killing seven people and injuring many others. Ten months later, the state began to remove all tolls from the Merritt Parkway and the Connecticut Turnpike, resulting in a loss of $69 million in annual revenues. Then, at 1.30 a.m. on June 28, 1983, part of the Mianus River Bridge on the Connecticut Turnpike collapsed, plunging four vehicles into the river. Three people died and three more were injured. With the collapse of the Mianus River Bridge back in 83, we established a major infrastructure renewal program which provided dedicated revenues, specifically the gasoline tax, car registration, license fees, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that would be specifically used to improve the transportation system, both highway and transit within the state. Here we are 15 years from its inception, and we've spent probably close to $10 billion on that system to do improvements to both our roadways and our transit system. So that improvement has to continue. 
Financial pressures have continued to increase as state roads carry ever-increasing numbers of vehicles. Because of the climate where we, we are situated in the Northeast, our roads deteriorate uh, far quicker than, say, some roads out in uh, Arizona or Florida. On the interstates, you have a huge majority of, of uh, heavy truck traffic going through there. And the bridges take a, a physical pounding year after year, uh, especially through the winter. Each year we're out here, especially when you work on some of the interstates, you never ever see the volume of traffic being reduced. It always seems from year to year pumping more cars through the projects. It's a tremendous amount of traffic. In order to help finance its $3.5 billion maintenance program, the state issued bonds in the mid-80s and early 90s. Today, about 40% of the DOT budget goes to debt service for these bonds, significantly limiting its ability to do new construction. One long-planned major reconstruction project is the rebuilding of the 50-year-old Quinnipiac River Bridge near the I-95, I-91 interchange in New Haven, one of the most congested areas in the state. Estimated construction costs for the project range from $800 million to $1.5 billion. It wasn't designed for the type of traffic and the volume of traffic that it's carrying today, particularly an extensive amount of truck traffic. During the commuter hours, inbound into New Haven, you're looking at an hour to two hours of traffic congestion, and outbound in the evening, about an hour to two hours that way as well. And the traffic, if there's a breakdown in particular, since there are no breakdown areas on the bridge, traffic can be backed up for miles with just a simple problem on the bridge. All transportation projects undergo a complex and time-consuming planning process. The state DOT began a 10-year study of the Quinnipiac River Bridge in 1989. You need a number of approvals on the federal level, on the state level, as well as the coordination with local governments to ensure that what you're doing is not going to have a disastrous effect on the neighborhoods. As far as number of agencies, there's probably 50. So it's the full gamut from federal, state, and local. After a five-year design phase, reconstruction of the Q Bridge and its surrounding highways is likely to begin in 2004 and continue for 12 to 15 years. Plans are being made to cope with potentially massive traffic disruptions during construction. The state transportation agenda has always been greatly influenced by federal funding. Since 1992, the annual federal transportation grant to the state has averaged about $350 million. Congress recently passed a record-breaking transportation bill that will increase the state's grant by about $58 million to $408 million a year. The state's gas tax, the highest in the country, generated $504 million in the last year. After a three-cent reduction in 1997, the state legislature further cut the unpopular tax by another four cents to 32 cents per gallon, effective July 1998. This year's reduction means 53 million less a year for the state transportation fund. Surplus state tax revenues and the increased federal grant will replace the lost revenues. Availability of financing is not the only factor limiting new construction. I don't think you're going to see very many new roads built in the state. Environmentally, socially, I think it's going to be very difficult to get those through the process. What you will see is relatively minor safety capacity improvements to the existing facilities. You'll see some innovative management techniques used to try to improve the, the flow of that traffic to get the people to use a different mode of travel, whether it's a bus, whether it's a rail, whether it's riding together. The I-95 corridor from New Haven to the New York State Line has what is referred to as incident management within the corridor. The whole corridor is monitored by TV cameras. We have a control station down in Bridgeport which monitors that. We have signs up on the roadway, variable message signs, where we can direct traffic around any accidents or any incidences that occur. We also have the same type of a system up in the Hartford area. On I-95, the Merritt and Route 1, the DOT has a goal of reducing rush hour traffic congestion by 10% within the next five years. That fine tuning of the system is the first thing that we, we always want to do. 
but there's sections of the state where that's probably not going to be enough. Southwestern Connecticut, the Hartford area, southeastern Connecticut, New Haven, other areas of the state where demand is exceeding even the ability of the existing system uh, to handle it. We're going to get at improved conditions by better management of the capacity we have. The only way to manage capacity effectively is to rethink transportation as a consumer service, not as a physical fact of concrete and steel. What we have to do, therefore, is give people choices that don't force them to live substandard lives or to give up things they already have. So what we need to do instead is to maximize choice, give people financial incentives to choose another way or another time to go to work. So what we really see, therefore, is time shifting, go earlier, go later, place shifting, work from home, and mode shifting, out of the car into the train. Those three shifts can easily get us our 5% reduction that we need for congestion, and then 1% a year thereafter for about five more years. If we give more choices, more people will go in different ways, and we'll continue to manage our way through the problem. Our average occupancy during the peak hour is only 1.2 people in every car. So there's a lot of cars that are just single occupant. If we could increase that number to 1.5, for instance, we'd have a drastic reduction in the traffic that occurs on the roadways during those peak hours and actually wouldn't require any major improvements. There are approximately 450,000 commuters daily in the greater Hartford area, and 80 to 85% of them are driving alone. While in, the, in years past, Everyone used to commute from the suburb to downtown. Uh, now about 85% of those commuters go suburb to suburb, uh, which makes it very difficult for non-automobile uh, systems to, to meet their needs uh, because there is insufficient density uh, for transit in particular. What residents value about their mobility and where they live, work, and shop might be the most challenging problem for transportation planners. What we find so lovely about commuting by ourselves is it's convenient and we can come and go when we want and we're very happy if we can park next to the desk for free. If we have to start paying for parking, we're not so happy. If we have to walk from the, from the car to the, to the place where we work, we're not so happy. Uh, but we're still probably more happy than if we had to be sharing the ride. In the early 1980s, the Connecticut DOT helped to start three not-for-profit corporations to encourage more people to change their commuting habits. Basically, our mission is to get people from driving alone into an alternate form of transportation. Both for economic and environmental reasons, we're not going to take those two-lane highways and make them four-lane highways. So we've got to look at managing uh, the system that we have in place. And when we talk about managing the system we have in place, that means we've got to get people into carpools and van pools and, and innovative forms of transit. I really need to find a better ride to work. Well, you can, and it's simple. Just pick up a free copy of the commuter's register. Since their founding, Rideshare in Windsor, Metropool in Stamford, and Rideworks in New Haven have had mixed success in promoting van pooling, car pooling, and bus shuttles to the commuting public. Recently, they have intensified aggressive marketing of their services to commuters through the commuter register, advertising, and the Internet. The key is it's a system, it's a branded system, and it's sold as a system. We don't market it as van pooling because van pooling doesn't really mean much to anyone. We market it as a commuter system and we reserve a seat for you just as you would reserve a seat on a train or a bus. Financial incentives and restrictive regulations also can greatly influence driver habits. We have a discipline called transportation demand management where our philosophy is that we want people to pay more uh, during peak hours. Uh, we want to change land use planning regulations to favor more transit friendly development. Politically it's very unpopular because we're intervening with people's free choice and free decision making process. The purpose of disincentives is to change people's behavior. Obviously regulations are one form to do it. You can't travel or you can't take the car or only HOVs with two or more occupants can use this lane. Those are disincentives. But cost is the other major factor. And disincentives can either be parking charges, so it'll cost you more to drive your car and arrive at a certain time at the parking garage. Uh, they could involve tolls on a highway. If we can make it more enticing, uh, maybe by giving a tax credit or another incentive, maybe we'll entice more people to use these mass transits. Now, someday, 
we have to start to begin to realize what are we doing to our children, children, what are we doing to our ecology, what are we doing to ourselves. I don't want to say mandate, it's, it's a tough word to use, but maybe under dark conditions you're going to have to mandate. Maybe uh, you can drive your car three days a week and, and he can drive his car three days a week and one day we all rest. What I would be calling for maybe is people would consider giving up that car for a day and riding with somebody else or for two days. I think we can make this happen, but it's going to take a little giving on all our parts. In an attempt to encourage ride sharing by commuters, the state established high occupancy vehicle lanes on I-84, I-384, and I-91 in the Hartford area. More HOV lanes in the area are being considered. HOV lanes are in use in about 25 municipalities nationwide with varying degrees of success. Connecticut DOT officials admit that the lanes are being underutilized, but say that as traffic conditions continue to worsen, more commuters will use the lanes. You need to remember that for every vehicle that's in the HOV lane, that's two or more vehicles that are not in the, in the, uh, the regular lanes. And one of the main purposes of an HOV lane is to provide relief for the other lanes. And so while you may not see as many vehicles as you'd want to see, remember it's not a vehicle count, it's a body count. It's a person count. Today, 96% of the travel in the state is by automobile, with only about 2% each by rail and by bus. For the last half of the 19th century, public transit was by street horse car. When electric trolleys replaced horse cars in 1893, thousands of working class families were able to move to nearby suburbs for the first time. Real estate developers who knew where the lines were heading often bought up the land and created subdivisions in advance of the line even. So there were great profits, of course, to be made in suburban subdivisions even then. Americans loved the trolley car, thought it was a great thing. But then the car came along and then uh, they remembered all the things they didn't like about the trolley. They were crowded oftentimes at rush hour or whenever you really needed to take one. And of course, there's also the inconvenience of having to go on someone else's schedule and they'll only go between certain points. The car offered an incredible amount of freedom and privacy compared to that. But I think more or less the public simply made it clear that they preferred the car and they wanted the government to get into the road building business. The trolley system spurred the golden age of the city. Streetcar railway tracks emanated out from the central city like spokes on a wheel. As the automobile grew in popularity, more and more former city dwellers moved to the suburbs, but still remained connected to the city. They did some studies in the 30s on traffic patterns in Connecticut, and they were astounded to find that most of the traffic around the major cities in Connecticut were in and out. People were still working downtown in the business district. They were still shopping down there, and it created tremendous problems for Connecticut cities. It changed the whole nature of the street, Instead of it being an extension of the sidewalk, it became a conduit to move traffic. And now it is so easy to turn your back on the city because the things you used to have to go to the city to get uh, for shopping or for employment have also gone to the suburbs. So most people can turn their back on the city without any ill effects to their lives. As dependence on the automobile has increased over the years, there has been a corresponding decline in public transportation systems, leading to hardships for some. In Connecticut, 124,000 households, or 10%, do not own an automobile. We're so spread out now. You know, the, the buzzwords that we use, sprawl, suburbanization, decentralization, the outer city, the edge city, slurbs, rural urban fringe. I mean, we're so spread out that it makes it very difficult to provide mass transit systems that will be available to everyone. Only 6% of the people on welfare have an automobile. If these jobs are out in the suburbs, how do they get to these jobs? You know, it's easy to take a bus and get out to a mall at 10 o'clock in the morning. If you're coming home at 10 o'clock at night, it's not so easy. The bus system follows the same patterns as the old trolley systems. It's all based on center city and getting people the spoken wheel system. We're now engaged in a major study to take a look at whether or not we can and, and how should we change the system to meet the demands of people today. Unlike other states where regional and local municipalities help fund mass transit, 
Operating costs for public transit in Connecticut is almost wholly funded by the state. About 40 percent of the State Department of Transportation's $298 million operating budget subsidizes the state's two commuter rail services and 20 bus transit service providers. There's no municipal support. There's no regional support. And the state, I think, you know, reaches a point where it says, well, if you want to do these things, you're going to have to start adding up. And so far, this region has not chosen to do that, nor has any region in Connecticut. Transit will simply not make money. There's always going to be a subsidy. In the mid-1970s, the Greater Hartford Transit District began a project with the goal of building a modern electric trolley system from downtown Hartford to Bradley Field. The 19-mile mass transit project was to have been built on the old Griffin Rail Line right-of-way. It had been hotly debated from the start. Griffin Line proponents claimed the $452 million project would attract about 18,000 riders a day and create a variety of benefits. We need to make a different kind of strategic infrastructure investments so that, in fact, we can get out of the box that we've put ourselves in over the last 50 years. One of the interesting features of a rail line is that inherently it creates points of commerce. Wherever the community chooses to have a station means that people are gonna walk there, they're gonna ride their bike there, the bus stops are gonna be established there, and there'll be some park and ride facilities at that point of commerce, and it really creates a whole new inviting investment environment for real estate developers. It's complicated. It costs hundreds of millions of dollars, and it takes years simply to do the preliminary planning, let alone the engineering, design, and construction. But the fact of the matter is, state participation is the linchpin. And unfortunately, our State Department of Transportation hasn't seen the overall value of such an investment. In April, under unrelenting opposition from the State Department of Transportation, the Capital Region Council of Governments voted to abandon the Griffin Line project, leading some to accuse the DOT of a continuing obsession with building highways at the expense of mass transit. DOT officials deny a road building bias and cite the high cost of the project as the reason for their position. That quarter is not a major quarter of um, uh, congestion. Um, it would be uh, very difficult for us to allocate scarce federal and state resources to that particular quarter. While I can salute the idea, I find it difficult to justify the economics, even for someone like myself who is a strong proponent of public transportation. DOT support for commuter train travel along the shoreline has been substantial. In 1985, the DOT and the Metropolitan Transit Authority of New York jointly created the Metro North Commuter Railroad. Today, about 90% of Connecticut's commuters to New York use the train. Right now, we have probably the largest, uh, close to the largest and most successful rail line in the country in Metro North, the New Haven Line. Uh, we have 28,000 people a day traveling on that line, and we lose $26 million a year. That's the subsidy. Every time a passenger gets on Metro North, it costs $1.90 state subsidy to subsidize their operation. In 1990, the state started a second commuter rail service, the Shoreline East, providing service between New London and New Haven. The line carries about 600 commuters daily and is subsidized at $5.5 million a year. The subsidy that's from the taxpayers on Shoreline East is more than $16. So every time someone gets on that train, the taxpayers are subsidizing it to the effect of $16. We have got to do things to increase the number of riders on that road to make it viable for the long term. Two weeks after the death of the Griffin Line proposal, the DOT announced that they were rejecting widening I-84 in favor of other options, including HOV lanes, enhanced bus service, or light rail mass transit. Economic development typically follows transportation improvements. In 1999, Amtrak plans to initiate high-speed train service between Boston and Washington, leading some to predict related development and greater demand for housing in state coastal cities and suburban towns along the line. Increased mobility leads to increased suburban development. The most rural parts of the state have become more susceptible to change as sprawl reaches more Connecticut towns. The reason we have suburban sprawl and now rural sprawl 
uh, is because we built a significant highway system at tremendous public subsidy, put the access out there, and then allowed the development to take place on a helter-skelter basis along those highway corridors. Uh, and so we don't have real density uh, to support at this point other alternative forms of, of transportation uh, which require density to be successful. I think that we either have to decide that we're going to move towards a development pattern that allows both walking and alternate means of transportation, or we're going to be sitting in traffic um, much, much more than we are now and much, much more than we ought to or want to. Suburban drivers and their many destinations present the biggest challenge to transportation planners. Without a significant change in residential and commercial development patterns, congestion will continue to grow and suburban sprawl will further threaten the loss of the state's historic character. It's a land use decision first and then a transportation decision. What we have done in this country is we create a residential zone, we create an office zone, we create a manufacturing zone, we create an industrial zone, and there are part we need to begin thinking about in terms of getting away from the separatism of land use and begin to have land uses that are next to each other, uh, interwoven with one another, so that you have choices. You don't have to get in your car to go to work or to go shopping or to go to a movie uh, or to go to a playground. Probably the ideal from a transportation standpoint would be to have certain areas that would be very high concentration of employment, high concentration of um, uh, residences, that kind of a thing, if that could occur on a, on a regional basis, a county type basis. We do have regional uh, planning agencies that attempt to do that both from a transportation standpoint and a development standpoint. They've had limited success with that. Transportation issues are increasingly the focus of regional groups composed of local governments. Land use, planned growth and transportation are among the regional group's biggest challenges. Those decisions are primarily made by town planning and zoning commissions. And that's a very closely cherished job. They don't want to give that up to anyone else. People want to respect each other's borders, but sometimes the zoning is different historically along a border, and it's harder to make it as compatible as it would be if the zoning was similar. Individual communities essentially rely on property taxes so that communities tend to chase what they would consider desirable development, manufacturing plant, to an office building. Municipalities willing to dance with the market will create development sites that may or may not be the best for the region. In late 1996, 11 environmental, business and civic planning organizations based in towns from Brantford to Greenwich organized into a group called the Coastal Corridor Coalition with a common recognition that congested roads were threatening the economic and environmental health of coastal Connecticut. It's very difficult because people are crazed commuters twice a day and they are protective homeowners the balance of the time. And so we have a very strong tradition and self-image of home rule in the state. There's an aversion to certain kinds of regional solutions. On the other hand, we are seeing that the economy has become regional that services are delivered on a regional basis. So if we can try for some regional solutions that don't require governmental structures, we will find people willing to cooperate. In the Greater Hartford region, Capital Region Council of Governments, a 29-town organization of mayors and first selectmen, regularly addresses transportation issues. There certainly is a willingness among the communities to talk among themselves. I think as suburbanization has continue to occur in, in this area. There is a realization that it doesn't make a lot of sense to keep duplicating a lot of public infrastructure investments, transportation being one of them. So I guess we've had some success in terms of beginning the dialogue, but uh, I think we still have a ways to go on that. And I think the conversations that we've facilitated have made those communities take a real hard look at the way they function, the way they allow development to occur, and the real impacts of that development. The typical suburban lifestyle requires a car. Getting people to change how they live, work, and travel is acknowledged by all to be extremely difficult, if not impossible. Well, I think realistically, people are going to continue to expect to be able to drive to wherever they want to go. Uh, and it's going to become increasingly difficult. 
but I think increasingly a number of people are going to realize that they can't do what they've been doing and, and continue to maintain the quality of life. So I think that we're going to see, particularly in those areas such as along the coast or in the Hartford area, where there is sufficient number of people, we're going to see a, a, an expansion of our public transportation system. Uh, maybe we should think of alternative patterns, not only in land development, but also in transportation development. So the question isn't, how do we do away with the automobile? It isn't, how do we stop suburbanization? The question is, what's the next logical step in our technological evolution? And that's what we're struggling with around the state. It's gonna require a fundamental change, though, in how the public thinks, what the public values, what the market requires us to provide. Can we make that change? Uh, there are a lot of professionals that think we can. Uh, will we make the change? Uh, that's probably a matter of political will. As we've just seen on From Here to There, we have an existing and growing transportation problem in Connecticut. We're going to talk about that today and see if anyone has any magic solutions. I doubt it, but we're going to give it a go. Gentlemen, a very basic question at the beginning here. From where you sit, what do you think are some of the kinds of things that might be done to get us on the road to a more open road? Mr. Martinez. I think one of the keys to that is really providing choices for the commuter and for the average driver um, in Connecticut. Uh, we all love our cars. We love to have the independence of the car to go when we want to go and to return when we want to return. And the key really here is can we provide alternatives to that via either the bus, via uh, um, carpooling and van pooling, things of that nature. And that's really going to be the key is for people to change the way that they're really driving. Mr. Coleman, what are your thoughts? There's no big fix. It's going to be incremental. It's going to come over time. And we have to offer uh, those in the automobile an alternative uh, in terms of how they choose, particularly in terms of how they choose to get to work, which is where we can make the first major improvement in terms of offering them alternatives to ride the bus, ride the train, be in a van pool, be in a carpool, and finding ways to make that happen. It, it would seem to me that in the last several decades, we've probably made our situation worse just be kind, because of the kinds of lifestyles that, that develop. And it would seem to me that all that does is, is make that weld between person and car even stronger rather than diminish it. Mr. McGee, that being the case, uh, how do you break that weld? But, you know, that, I'm not sure that supposition is the right one. The automobile in our type of an environment, you know, we're kind of an edge city environment. People live further out. The automobile is very critical in that. I mean, 95% of the public who get to work come by car. And we've got to be realistic about this. That is going to be the pattern for the foreseeable future. The issue during rush hour is a peak, two hours in the morning, three hours in the evening, in which the system can't handle the volume. So the question is to focus on that peak. Not everybody has to get out of their car. It's on the margins that's critical. And we have an issue with DOT that we think we need to manage these resources together better. The issue is really the management of bus and rail and highway better. Mr. Martinez, how do you respond I, to that? I, I think that's true. Joe's really hitting the point there is that you're not going to get people to get out of their cars completely and it's part of the, the, the way of living today. And the key is how, how can we as a department, a state department, how can we manage that better and how can we provide more alternatives for people? Mr. Coleman? I think Joe's partly right. Um, Clearly, we're not going to give up our cars. And the focus has to initially be on, on the commute trip. That's where we can make a difference. But at the same time, we all know that if we do nothing and we let the present trends continue, the premise that's set forth in the, in the program is absolutely correct, that the rush hour or rush two hours will become a rush 12 hours. And, and because 
and we also all agree we're not going to be able to build ourselves out of our present situations. Let's talk about the place where most people are going in creating the problem, and that is to work. I found it fascinating during the uh, program that mention was made of we have to change some elements of the workplace. There's no question. I mean, typically we blame DOT. We all say they're the bad guys and we beat them up because they're not doing a good job. But the reality is the way we work is critical. And companies do have a role to play in this in terms of flexible hours, compressed work weeks, telecommunication. The issue of transit check, cashing out parking, so that you kind of put driving to work and commuting to work on a more even keel financially. Yeah, we should be doing more of that. So uh, there's no one to blame. Each of us has a role to play. Um, but there are, I think, some solutions here that are worth pursuing. And I think the key, like Joe was saying, it's not the traditional solutions that we, we were used to years ago, whether it's more roads or more buses or more trains. I think there's a number of new kinds of things that really have to be looked at that'll save the trip and keep people at home or do alternate hours of, of work is going to help us quite a bit. Here's the issue we have. We've built a wonderful mass transit system to take people from Connecticut to Manhattan. Premier, one of the best in the world, no question. The point we've got is we need to build a system for this market. We've built a wonderful system to take people from Connecticut to New York. We need to build an equally wonderful system within the state of Connecticut. Or, or to get them to ride this system. What's fascinating about in Joe's area is that while 85% of the people going into New York will ride the train, right. intrastate from New Haven to to, to, the, to the Connecticut border, New York border, only 2% ride the train. Right. And that mm -hmm. system is the same. That's what's fascinating. Right. Same service and it's across the state, but in the Hartford area, we have about 450,000 commuters. 80% of them are driving alone. What that says is that you've got three empty seats with a driver already in this state. That's a million empty seats that we could put people into. We don't have to create anything. Right. It's there. It's running. Let me, let me ask one other question in a, in a different area but related to this, and that is planning where those jobs are that people are going to have to go to, land use planning, whatever you want to call it. We have the state government, which tells us what to do, and we have the local communities. We don't have, really have anything in between. We don't have any county government. We have some regional planning agencies. They don't often seem to have that much clout. Mr. McGee, you used to be the economic development commissioner of this state. There you go. And if a company said to you, I, I'd like to move to your state. I picked out a site in Rocky Hill. I want to move there. I'll bring a thousand jobs there. Would you be able to say no because that doesn't fit into our overall transportation plan? No, because I have to balance a decision. Joblessness versus congestion. Which one do you take? I'd rather have a job and sit in traffic than have no job and sit in no traffic. Mr. Martinez, sometimes your department is told or asked, we need you to put in a new exit ramp so people can get to that mall. And the biggest growth is in, that, is in the, the suburbs. Uh, the biggest travel demand is suburbs, suburbs to suburbs. Um, historically, we've built our interstate system and, and mo many of our road systems to serve the major urban areas. And so that's what's happening is the, is the suburbs are really the areas that are growing with those kinds of things and that just spreads out the traffic even more and it's m much harder to serve that kind of development uh, from a um, from a transit or, or a rail kind of perspective. I mean it is really highway oriented. There is, a, I mean, I, there, is a, there is an effort going on in the Hartford region, the Metro Hartford Millennium effort, which is, is starting to, to discuss and begin to address these issues on a regional and intertown basis to begin to see whether or not there is a way uh, to to make location decisions that benefit the region as opposed to just benefiting a community. As we all know, but, you know, one of the real rubs is that we have a local tax base. And until we find a way to do tax, you know, revenue sharing on a non-local basis, uh, that's going to be a very difficult issue to break. Psychologically, to make progress in this area, what's the best way to go? Disincentives such as we're going to charge you more money to park close to, the, uh, to your job or incentives? What's the best way to go? We have found in our business, in the, in the ride sharing business, that the single most important thing that will make people make a decision is the cost of parking. So if, if, you, if you can park free next to your desk, which is what everyone wants to do, that's what they're going to try and do. But if you begin to, in those instances where parking is charged and the closer you get to quote market rates uh, the, and you have alternatives in place, um, then you begin to see decisions made to go to other forms of transportation. But you can't do one without the other. You can't just say we're going to charge $100 a month for parking and say, okay, find your way to work. That's not fair. Whatever the combination is, if that's the way we're going to go with a combination of incentives and disincentives, 
who has to foster that? Would it be better if you asked the private sector to deal with that on their own versus getting government involved? I, I think it's really got to be a joint venture. Both the private sector and the public sector work together. We can provide the alternatives. The, pub, the private sector can really provide uh, the disincentives, if you want to call it that, i.e., limit the amount of parking or cost on the parking side in order to get people to really change it. Mr. McGee, do you think that the program we've just seen is in some ways a wake-up call to both the private sector and the public sector that now is the time to get going before this gets much worse? Uh, if you want to see the future, just go to California, and there's the transportation system from hell. It is at peak capacity all day long. We are not there yet. So we have got about maybe five years to really work very hard to make some changes. And I would just add, you can't ask people to get out of their car and move into mass transit if that system, if that service isn't up to snuff. If I can't park at the railroad station, there's no incentive in the world that's going to get me to take the train. So we've got some heavy lifting to do in each community to get parking available, to tie the bus and train schedules together. And I'm a strong, strong transit advocate. But you have the, all these people that cry like hell, we want more transit, and yet they're not willing to do in their communities those things necessary to make transit work, right. i.e., put parking in place. Right. I mean, you've got all these communities, we want, we, want, want, we want to use more use of the train. We want to, I mean, we've had the argument along the 84 West Corridor. We want transit. But if you say you want a transit stop in your community or you want a parking garage in your community that would support that transit, then they say, no, thank you. You can't have it both ways. I mean, if you, you, right. you've got to be willing to make those public policy decisions to put the alternatives in place that will support those alternatives. Are we at the point right now where politically that this would be a, a plus for someone to at least make this an issue to try to resolve? Or do you think politicians run away from this issue because they look at it and it's so complex and it's a no-win situation. So the most you can do is, as we said before, work the edges. These things are so complex that you tend to tick off more people at the end of the day. Every time you want to close a, an entrance to a highway mm -hmm. or expand parking, you piss off some constituency. So politicians tend to shy away from it. Well, let me ask Mr. Martinez. You're, you're on the receiving end of that. You're, you're being told by private sector groups like Mr. McGee's as well as politicians that something's got to be done. Well, I, that's true. And, and the real issue here, is it a political uh, solution to it? I think that's part of it. Uh, but really, you, it, you've got to have the private sector involved in that. You've got to have the commuter involved in that, the person that's traveling from point A to point B. They've got to understand the issues that are there and how they can be part of that solution to help cure that. The state has to step up with, with either dollars or, or policies to carry forward with that. We have 169 mm -hmm. towns there who each have their own individual land use controls. That's very difficult from a transportation standpoint. Mr. Coleman, I'll give you the last word. I don't think that anyone, I, we could have said maybe five or ten years ago that somebody might have lost election trying to run on this, on these ideas. I don't think anyone would lose elections, but I'm not sure they would get elected as this is their, their main position. All right. Yet. On that semi-pessimistic viewpoint, we'll close up. We hope this program has at least uh, awakened uh, the uh, motoring public out there that everybody has a role in the answer to this crisis. Gentlemen, we thank you all for being with us and have a pleasant commute back home. Thank you. Thank you.